Well, good morning, Walden Church. It's so good to see all of you and to have you back here with us. Of course, those of you who are watching online, thank you for being here as well. Uh, we're all together, right? We are all together. For the last couple of weeks, we have been in a new sermon series, The Seven Woes of the Religious Leaders. And just to recap, you could say, well, what is that? The seven woes are judgments. They're judgments against the current spiritual leaders of Jesus' time. They're called out each time by Jesus, and Jesus always begins one of these phrases with the same three words, woe to you, woe to you. That's why they're called the seven woes. Now, in the Greek, uh, the word woe is the word ou-i, Uai, okay? Uai is defined as a primary exclamation of grief. A primary exclamation of grief. We probably don't say woe anymore, but I suppose you could fill in your own word that you would use for a primary exclamation of grief. <laughs> so what is Jesus doing? Well, Jesus is invited over to a meal to a Pharisee's home, and the religious leaders are probably scoping him out. They're probably prepared to test him or to grill him with questions. Jesus is not going to sit under the microscope for them. Instead, he's going to turn this whole event on its head, and he's going to make the argument that they have, in fact, neglected their responsibility as community leaders, they have also neglected their responsibility as ministry leaders. Now, why would we as a church study this? You could say, well, surely there aren't any Pharisees anymore. Surely the teachings that they taught have died away with them. I'd like to think so, but the truth is, you know, the teachers may have died, but I think the things that they taught, I think those things, they live on. Matthew 23, just to recap where we kind of have come from, uh, verse 1, it says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. Jesus says, look at all your holy rollers, your men of ministry that you hold in such high regard. They sit in the seats of authority. They wear the heavy robes of scholars and they wear all the priestly ornaments. In fact, they love to go into the marketplace and they love it when you call them rabbi or teacher or preacher or pastor. They love that title. They love everything about the job. But then Jesus says, don't listen to them. Don't follow them. Why? Because they don't practice what they preach. And you know, as a side note, I really have no idea why the religious leaders wanted to kill Jesus. It makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> On our first week, Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. And then he looks around at his dinner guests, his hosts, and he just sees how legalistic they are and how they are with hand washing and cup washing. And Jesus says, You Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not he who make the outside make the inside also? Hey, make no mistake. If you give Jesus a platform, if you give Jesus a microphone, he is going to say something. He's going to tell you what he thinks. You know, in our first week when we talked about uh, being more like children, remember we said Jesus' teaching is confrontive, right? He is not going to pull any punches. So, what does he have for us today? Verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin. So what is this about? Well, those are all spices, 
right? Those are spices from your kitchen. And Jesus is again talking about how legalistic they are. The Bible says to tithe, yes. The Bible says to give one-tenth of all that you own. So the religious leaders took it all the way. Here is one-tenth of my mint. Here is one-tenth of my dill weed. Here is one-tenth of my cumin. That seems a little over the top, right? Where did they get this kooky idea? Well, they actually got it from the Old Testament. They got it from the Bible, particularly from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 14 says, You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year. You shall eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, and of your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And if the way is too long for you, so that you are not able to carry the tithe when the Lord your God blesses you. You can say, well, Pastor David, that sounds exactly like God wants us to tithe a tenth of our spice rack. Maybe, but if you take a close look at it, right at the top it says, you shall eat it. Right? It says you get to eat it. See, what God wanted them to do was this. Pack a lunch. Right? Pack a picnic with your family. Maybe make it a tenth of the food that you had for the week. And then you take it to church. You take it to temple. You take it to synagogue. And you carried it with you into the Lord's house. This is biblical proof. Biblical evidence that potlucks are mandatory for holiness. Kind of. Sort of. Not really. But, but it's all a part of the offering. Okay? It was all part of the worship experience. Maybe you brought a small bird with you and it was sacrificed on the altar for your sins. And that reminded you of the relationship. God is here, right? God is holy. I am a sinner and I need God daily. And, and that, that sacrifice reminded you of the relationship, reminded you of the mercy that was shown to you, the forgiveness that was shown to you. Then you sang a song from the Old Testament. This was your Bible reading, this was your prayer to God, and it also taught you about God, taught you about how he provided for you, how he showed justice to the foreigner, how he loved you. Then perhaps you'd put some money in the temple treasury. That was a lesson too. That taught you that everything you owned belonged to God and you gave back a portion of the wealth that he gave you. And then you got out your picnic lunch. There was a tenth of the food that you had in the house and you ate it. And it was the reminder to you the food was a gift. That the things that you put in your body, the things that are essential to life, was a blessing. And that food gives us life. It goes into us. And so then it just comes full circle that everything is a gift. See, for many of us, coming to church on a Sunday is tradition. It's what you do, right? And I think for others, it's probably an obligation. If the doors are open, you come. But even beyond those reasons, for these people that live during Jesus' time, being in the temple was an experience. They didn't just sit. They didn't just stand. They sacrificed. They donated to the cause. They consumed. They lived this holistic life that said, what I take, I also give back. I am not just a consumer. I don't just look out for my own interests. I don't look out for my own profit margin or my own name or my own family. We are all in this together. We are all united. All of life is blessing. All of life is spiritual. All of life is a gift. And Jesus begins with, watch out for these Pharisees. They don't practice what they preach. So why do the Pharisees tithe their spices? I mean, the Bible does tell them to do that. Yes, but the Pharisees are so legalistic about it. They, they've taken it to the nth degree. Jesus says, you guys are so zealous for, for God's laws that you tithe even the smallest food, even your spice. You obey everything down to a tenth of your spice. 
But then watch how Jesus continues in verse 23. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. Jesus says, you're so legalistic over here, but not over here. And according to Jesus, the weightier, the heavier things, the things that are more important, Jesus says, you're ignoring that. You know, why, why are you tithing from your spice rack? God doesn't need dillweed in heaven, right? He needs ministers here on earth. What does Jesus want us to do? He says, I want you to gain weight, right? Gain weight. Can all of us do that? Can we all gain weight this summer? I am well on my way. Jesus says the weightier matters, right? The heavier matters are justice and mercy and faithfulness. Justice. Justice is the standard that we use to support fair treatment and due reward for all. In other words, it's how we see that everyone is treated fairly, everyone is treated ethically. And I believe as a nation, justice is one of our founding principles. It's what we all fought for, and it's what we are still fighting for even today. Jesus says the Pharisees didn't concern themselves in the matters of justice, primarily because they were sellouts. They made money off of the poor exactly like Rome. Although instead of doing it under the banner of the military or doing it under the banner of the government, they did it under the banner of religion. Mercy is compassion. It's forgiveness shown towards someone where you could also show them punishment. You could show them harm. As an institution, the Pharisees were in control. They could dole out blessing. They could dole out forgiveness. But they were not compassionate people. They did not love their congregation. They did not love their community. The people were a means to an end. They tolerated them. And if you watch Jesus, when he ministers, when he teaches, when he heals, before he heals, I mean, think about what a healing is. Jesus' healings were physical blessings, right? Physical restorations. But before he would do that, oftentimes he would say, your sins are forgiven, which is a verbal blessing. It's a spiritual blessing. Jesus is concerned with the whole person, right? Jesus shows mercy. And then faithfulness. Faithfulness is loyalty. It's being constant. It's being steadfast. This is not the same thing as having faith, right? Jesus doesn't say that the Pharisees have lost their faith. He's saying they're not faithful. Their loyalty was to Rome. Their loyalty was to their wealthy constituents. Jesus lists three spices, mint, dill, and cumin. And then, Jesus says, you neglect three heavier, more important things, justice, mercy, faithfulness. What does the Bible say about justice? Proverbs 18.5 says, it is not good to be partial to the wicked or to deprive the righteous of justice. Ecclesiastes 5 says, if you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness do not be amazed at the matter, for the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. Amos 5.24 says, But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Justice is an overarching theme in Jesus' kingdom message. It's no wonder that in all of the Gospels that we have of Jesus' life, there are so many examples of Jesus showing justice to people that lived on the outsides, on the outskirts. He touched and blessed fringe society. You know, justice extended to women in Jesus' life. And not just women. He reached out to a Canaanite woman who sought him on behalf of her sick daughter and to a Samaritan woman. He came to her in her time of need. Jesus didn't just touch lepers. He specifically touched a Samaritan 
leper. He, he was not just interested in criminals or, or thieves, but he redeemed a dying, condemned thief. In this, he cared for the poor, he cared for the abused, he cared for the abandoned, the ill, the immigrant, the widow, the orphan. All of this comes together in what we think Christ demands of his kingdom. What does the Bible say about mercy? Luke 6, 36, be merciful, even as your father is merciful. Micah 6, 8, he has told you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Psalm 23, 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our God is not just a sovereign God, and we love that. It's wonderful that he is. He's not only just a God of justice, but we are thankful that he is, but he is also the God of mercy. And the mercy of God is one of the most precious realities we have in this world. It's one of the most revealing themes in all of the Bible. It's one of the most tragically misunderstood things about God. God's mercy doesn't just show us who he is. God's mercy tells us something about ourselves. And what is that? That we have been shown mercy. Not only did we not deserve his favor, but we actually deserved his punishment. And Jesus stands before the religious leaders, these holy rollers, and he says, you know, on the one hand, you're so legalistic, you're so obedient. But on the other hand, you are neglecting the weightier aspects, aspects that God feels are more important. Jesus says you tithe, you give away, right? You lose weight, but I want you to gain weight. I want you to gain weight. With what? With justice and mercy and faithfulness. Jesus continues in verse 23. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. In other words, yes, you should do both. You should do both. It all matters. Your whole life matters. We're talking about living an undivided life throughout this series. You know, you can do this thing over here. Great. But what about this? Because it all matters. It's, it's like if you, if, if you or I said, hey, look, I go to church, uh, I teach Sunday school, I sing in the choir, I drop my envelope in the plate when it goes by. Are you proud of me, God? You know, look, God, I, I look great over here. I look great over here. And God says, but what about these things? What about the weightier things. Because right now, you lie to your boss. You lie to your friends. You, you, you do whatever it takes to make yourself look good. You, you cheat on your spouse. Maybe not physically, but you fantasize and you flirt. You ignore your role as a parent. You talk down to your children. You treat them terribly. You call them names. What about your thought life? What about those websites that you visit? What about the way you act online? What about the things you say? You know, how do you treat your coworkers? How do you treat your employees? How do you treat strangers? What is your attitude about gossip? I'm talking about people behind their back. What about your language? How do you speak? Is every other word a curse word? How do you treat your body? How do you treat your mind? How do you spend your money? Because don't you understand it all matters? Not just this, not just this, it all matters. It, it's, not, it's not just the things over here. Jesus says there are weightier matters, all of it. Remember the Hebrews. Remember how they worship. Remember how they go to synagogue. It's a, it's a holistic experience. It's not segmented, it's not cut up. All of life matters, and, and so all of worship matters. They're not just a believer on Sunday and a pagan on Monday. All of life is a gift. Jesus says, don't copy those religious leaders because they don't practice what they preach. Sure, you're doing great over here, but Jesus says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you are hypocrites. You tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, 
justice and mercy and faithfulness. You've neglected them. Neglected weightier matters. In other words, the more important stuff. You're losing weight. Jesus says, I want you to gain weight. You've all missed the big picture. Does that sound good? No, no nobody, wa- nobody wants to miss the big picture, right? Actually, do you see the big picture? Do you see the big picture here? Do you see what Jesus is so angry about? The Pharisees say, my relationship with God is A-OK, right? And I'm doing all the things that are required of me to go to heaven. But Jesus says, that's fine. But what about these things that are more important, like justice and mercy and faithfulness? Who do justice, mercy, and faithfulness affect? Others, right? These are the things we do that have a direct impact on others. The Pharisees were only looking out for themselves, looking out for number one. Church, watch out for pastors who care only about themselves and putting themselves first, putting their family first. Watch out for that CEO who's just worried about his big paycheck more than he's worried about his employees or his customers. You watch out for government officials. They just want that title. They just want that best seat at the restaurant. They don't care about the people that vote for them. People who are in leadership are responsible, Jesus says, for the people that they lead. Jesus says, woe to you, Pharisees. You tithe out your spice rack because you think that'll get you into heaven. But you have forgotten to show justice and mercy to others. Then Jesus finishes out with this little doozy in verse 24. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. (laughs) What does that mean? Well, it was a sin to eat some bugs, right? Insects. So to keep themselves pure, the Pharisees would put a lid, right, over their Yeti cooler. They would put cheesecloth over their cup and it would strain out bugs so they didn't eat the bugs. Because if you've ever had an open container outside, you, what happens? B- little bugs fly into your soda. Little bugs fly into your wine, right? Leviticus 11 actually speaks against this. It says, but stay away from all other insects that have wings and crawl. They will make you unclean. You don't want a gnat to get into your wine. Nobody does. Again, they want to be righteous. They want to be pure. They want to be holy. So they're taking, they're taking every precaution. And they care more about their own standing with God and their own relationship with God. Jesus says, you know, you guys are so devoted to personal holiness that you go to church twice a week, you go to Bible study, you read devotionals, you listen to other pastors online, but then you swallow a camel. (laughs) Why is that bad? Well, again, Leviticus 11 speaks about what animals are clean or unclean. It says some animals chew the cud, but they don't have split hooves. Don't eat these animals, camels, rock badgers, rabbits. Jesus says you try so hard not to eat little tiny bugs, but then you go and eat large animals. You obey the small things, in other words, but not the big things, not the things that are important. Jesus, what's important? Justice, mercy, faithfulness. You know, when he was asked, what's the most important commandment in all of scripture? Jesus said, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Okay, but what about tithing my spices? There is no other commandment greater than these. Yeah, but what if I accidentally eat a bug? Is that going to make God mad? 
There is no other commandment greater than these. What if I just work on my own relationship with God? You know, my personal holiness, my walk with God, isn't that enough? What do you think? Is it enough? Is this just about you? All of life is a gift, and that includes your neighbor. The command from Jesus is that we love God and we love others, and that there is no other commandment greater than these. Jesus said, for as much as you work, for as much as you're diligent about your personal holiness, you have forgotten justice, mercy, faithfulness. What about faithfulness? Did we forget that one? Let's look at that one. Proverbs 3 says, Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. The book of Proverbs says, Stick close to faithfulness. He says, in fact, wear it around your neck. Cover your heart with it. Why? Probably because faithfulness seems to be another one of those qualities that's not really highly regarded in our society. Because today, if something gives you trouble, you don't stick with it. You, you dump it. You just move on to the next thing. If a relationship isn't meeting all your needs and your dreams and your desires, you say, you know what? I'm going to go find somebody else that makes me happy. Today, if something breaks, throw it in the trash. It's not even worth fixing. We just chuck it. The world says, get a new one, right? Commitment to anything seems temporary. It seems we'll only tolerate something as long as it works for us. When things get difficult, our world says, change the channel, unsubscribe, dump him. Faithfulness means keeping our word. Faithfulness means doing what we said we would do. Faithfulness means sticking with something even when life gets difficult. Faithfulness means remaining in a relationship through the season where you're sacrificing, where you put somebody else's needs ahead of your own. Faithfulness means staying with your church through challenging times, through uh, encouraging your team, even if your team is losing, sticking with your friend, even when they make bad decisions. Our world needs more of that kind of faithfulness. Wouldn't you agree? In a world where everything seems tentative and uncertain and temporary, I think we need more people around us and supporting us who exhibit faithfulness. People we can trust. People we feel safe with. People who stand by us and know us and they are with us through all the seasons of life. I'm looking out my window and I'm wondering what Jesus would tell us now. I mean, right, there's no Pharisees today, but have we still lost sight of his kingdom? Am I just looking at my spice rack wondering what I should tithe and what I should bring to church? Am I just worried about my wine and drinking it through cheesecloth, hoping that I don't make God mad? Have I lost sight of what God really wants from me? from his church, for his kingdom? Do I care about justice and mercy and faithfulness? I used to be able to stand up here on a Sunday morning and say, I know some of you are struggling this morning, but today, during this cruel, cruel summer, I know I can confidently say, I know all of you are struggling this morning because I am struggling this morning. So let me remind you of this. 
God is faithful. God will be faithful to you. We will get through this. You are not alone. The Spirit of God is with you. He will empower you. He will strengthen you. He will support you. He will intervene for you. And hopefully, you sit in the midst of a group of people, your church, your community, who love you and who would do the same for you. Praise God that we worship the one who cares about justice and mercy and faithfulness. And so, when we are not here, when we are not gathered together as a church, and we are out there in the world, can we be asking ourselves, how can I show justice? How can I show mercy today? How can I exhibit faithfulness? How can I love my neighbor as myself? Because, as Jesus says, there's no other commandment greater than these. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are so grateful for the blessing of being able to come together as fellowship, as congregation, as family, as church. Your church is the plan to spread the love of Jesus, to dole out his forgiveness, to heal, to nurture. Lord, may your church continue to see the world through your eyes and to know where to elevate, to lift up, to encourage, to give blessing. And may we never forget that we are to be people who seek justice, who show mercy, who exhibit faithfulness, that we care about our neighbor. We love our brother and our sister with the same attention that we love ourselves. Lord, walk through us during this difficult time. Walk among us. Hold our hand and encourage us. Lay your healing hand on the backs of those who are suffering and who are bent over and who are hurting. We ask that you would continue to heal this country. Heal it not only of its physical ailments, but also its division. And bring us to a right understanding of you and your son. Heal this world. Unite this earth. Restore this world and heal us. We need this healing. We thank you for every blessing, for every good thing, for those in our life who are healthy and well. And as we go from this place, may we be your church in everything we say and everything we do. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching again. Of course, if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget that this is a link that you can share. You can post this to your own wall, uh, or you can share it with a friend or a family member who you think might need some encouragement this week. I love you guys. I'll see you soon. Bye.